Good morning. Oh, part of you are awake. Good morning. And what do you say when I say he is risen? Absolutely. Thank you for being here on this Resurrection Sunday. Let me just take care of a few um, announcements. There won't be any activities here this evening, so you can spend that with your family or uh, go to church with a, a family member somewhere else. So today, uh, this service is our only service for today. Coming up the 14th, that's this Friday, I believe, is Women's Hope Builders. It's a service designed specifically for women, a worship service to come together. You can be here at 6.30 and um, uh, participate in some snacks. If you've been around the Nazarene Church, there's always snacks before we do anything else. So you can be here then, or the service actually starts at 7, and you'll want to sign up and be a part of that in the foyer. Blood Drive is coming up the 20th, I believe, of April. And uh, we need your support. There's a place to sign up in the main foyer out here. So you take advantage of that as well. <clears throat> then coming up the 29th is something I want you to pay particular attention to. We all deal with people in situations of life that are hard and difficult. The 29th of, of this month, helping hurting people, uh, mental health first responder training. Now, you might think, uh, well, that's for somebody official that needs to do that. No, this is for anyone who wants to be equipped to be able to deal with uh, friends, family members who are having some uh, crises in their lives. And uh, there'll be some um, excellent speakers here on that Saturday. And there's a sign up out there. You can see uh, Tammy Jones. Stand up so we can see you. She'll be out in the foyer after the church, after church to talk to you about that. But I encourage you to uh, be a part of that. Uh, invite friends or uh, other churches to uh, be a part of that as well. Well, let's stand together and let's worship the Lord this morning. I serve a risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever men may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. In all Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along my narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujahs to Jesus Christ the King. The hope of all who seek Him, the help of all who find. None other is so lovely, so good and kind. He lives, He lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks. 
walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He Give the Lord praise this morning. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Oh! 
Amen. A glorious, glorious day. Listen closely as we hear from Peter. There were happy days long ago when my brother and I would put out into the Sea of Galilee, visiting one of our regular sweet spots just off the coast of our town, Capernaum. <laughs> the weight of the net as we'd haul it into the boat would almost be too much to bear. We put everything we had into the ropes, straining, bending our backs to it. Sweat would pour off of us, rolling into our eyes until we couldn't see, leaving the rope slippery in our hands. What pleasant pain we felt in our arms and backs once the catch was in. Our arms would throb, our backs. It felt as if they'd never straighten again. The palms of our hands were burned by the tough ropes. But soon we'd be back at it again, tossing the empty net out across the waves and hauling in the next catch. Those were the days. How I long for them those days of happy ignorance. I wonder if I'll ever know such peace again. For the last three years, I've lived with God. And now I've had a hand in killing him. Last night, after they buried Jesus, I went out into the city. The streets were so silent and black. And I wrapped the blackness around me, tried to forget what I'd done. Even then, I was so afraid. I was afraid that someone would see me, recognize me, and associate me with him. I was so ashamed, but I couldn't stop being afraid for myself. In my heart, I remembered what Jesus had said, that there was meaning to his death. But in my mind, all I could see was a coward who had denied even knowing him. He trusted me, and I thought only of myself. The street was empty, that twisted street that earlier had been filled with people laughing, mocking, spitting their hatred. It was empty. And I embrace the emptiness, like an old friend who understands your pain when no one else can. Now, for the first time since that day that Jesus called me, I couldn't feel him beside me. I was alone, so very much alone. The guard was asleep. Soon I was outside the city. Golgotha was nearby. From the city gate, you could smell the lingering death. I didn't want to see it, but something outside myself had brought me back.
path was still muddy from the storm. I tripped on the rocks in the darkness. I prayed that a bolt of lightning would strike me down in my wretched misery. But soon I was there and that ugly stand of wood was still there. Try as I might, I couldn't keep my eyes from going up that post to the cross beam that was still in place. God in heaven, how my heart was ripped in two by what I saw. The spikes were still there, still embedded in the wood, and still painted with his blood. I couldn't look at that cross without seeing the dying body of Jesus. I knew the cross was empty. I knew he was no longer there. But he was. He was. And I put him there. My cowardness put him there. But if, as my heart tells me, I alone am responsible for his death, then that would mean that he died only for me. And that's not what he said. Even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. No. We all put him there. The soldiers drove the spikes, but we all held him down so that they could. We all pulled on that rope that lifted him into place. We all left him to die alone, stripped of his friends, stripped of his dignity. (sighs) Jesus died for all of us, not just me. We're all guilty of the sins for which he died. It was an ugly way to die, but then he died for ugly things, didn't he? There's no pleasant way to die for the sins of all humanity. If Jesus loved me enough to die in my place, then I must find a way to love myself again. Perhaps in understanding his forgiveness of me, I'll learn the secret to forgiving myself. failures and hurts. We find ourselves here on this day. The empty tomb. As we begin to think of that first day, as we begin to realize the importance of those who made their way to that tomb. There are three witnesses who made their way to that tomb. But I want us to realize that this journey that we're on that we call life, just like Peter, it's filled with hurts. It's filled with failures. It's filled with struggles, 
each and every day. And sometimes, just like the song saying, <clears throat> that the choir sang, we're locked in our own tombs until we can become set free, set free from the things that bind us. So the question for us today is this. Do your troubles, do your trials, do your difficulties soften, harden, or transform us for Jesus? Lou Holtz says this, life is 10% of what happens to you and 90% of how you respond to it. I believe that's a, that's a good understanding because we have a choice in how we respond to the situations of life. There was a, a daughter who went to her mother and told her about her life that seemed to be falling apart. Her life that was full of things that were so hard for her to handle each and every day. She didn't know how she was going to make it and wanted to just give up. But she sought the counsel of her mother. She was tired of fighting and struggling, just making it from one point to the other. And, and before you know it, she would solve one problem or one situation in life. And, and sure enough, something new came up. That was a new struggle, a new difficulty. So her mother said, well, we need to go to the kitchen Food's always good, isn't it? She took her to the kitchen, but it wasn't for a snack. She filled three pots with water and placed each of them on the stove under a high burning fire. Soon the pots began to boil. And in the first, she placed carrots. In the second pot, she placed eggs. And in the third pot, she placed coffee beans. She let them sit and boil. Sitting in the kitchen, she and her daughter not saying a word, just watching. In about 20 minutes, she turned the burners off and she fished the carrots out and placed them in a bowl. She pulled the eggs out, placed them in a bowl. She took a ladle uh, in the coffee uh, pot and and poured some of it into a bowl. Turning to her daughter, finally saying something, she looked at her and said, what do you see? The daughter said, carrots, eggs, and coffee. Her mother brought her just a little bit closer, and she asked her to feel the carrots. The daughter noted that those carrots were now soft, the mother then asked her to take an egg and break it open. Doing so, she pulled the shell off and observed that it was now hard-boiled egg. Finally, the mother asked the daughter to take a sip of the coffee, and the daughter smiled as she tasted it, and its rich aroma filled the kitchen. The daughter then asked her mother, what does all this mean? Her mother explained that each of these objects had faced adversity, boiling water. Each reacted differently. The carrot that had been hard and strong and unrelenting, after being subject to the boiling water, became softened and weak. The egg that would be fragile and the outer shell protected its liquid interior, but after sitting in boiling water, the inside became hardened. The ground coffee beans were unique, however. As they were in the boiling water, they in turn transformed the water into something new. Something with a fresh aroma. Something that was good. So again, life, life is 10% of what happens to us, 90% of how we respond to it. So how do we respond to the troubles, the trials, the difficulties of our lives? Do we soften and give up? 
Do we harden ourselves against God or do we allow God to transform us even in the difficulties? It was that first Resurrection Sunday. And we find in John chapter 20 an account that I want us to look at quickly this morning. Beginning with verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciple, disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but didn't realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking it was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabbani, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that she had said the things that he had said to her. As we look at these three people who began their journey at the empty tomb, what was it like? What were they thinking? It doesn't say in scripture, but I want you to sort of imagine with me what was going through the minds of these three individuals. Mary Magdalene, Mary Magdalene was the one that Jesus <clears throat> had healed, had set her free from seven demons. And we find that scripture in Luke chapter 8, verses 1 and 2. She had been cured and others even at the same time. So she had an intimate experience with Jesus that had changed and transformed her life. Mary was one of the most loyal followers of Jesus and his disciples. She was present at the crucifixion. She was the first one to arrive at the tomb. And as she was headed to the tomb, what do we think was on her mind? I mean, she had invested her life. She had been changed for a lifetime. But I believe that if she was heading to the tomb, it was about the here and now. Here's our situations. Here's where we are. She was headed to the tomb because she wanted to make sure that there were proper burial procedures that were done for her Lord and her Savior. She had a task in mind. She had a purpose for what she was headed to do. And so she was focused on getting to the tomb. 
From her personal perspective, life was over as she had known it in following Jesus. But she had determined with her heart She wasn't going to be like the others. There was a task that needed to be completed. And so she wasn't going to hide in fear that she would be the next one to be killed or taken. She wasn't wallowing in her grief and sadness. She gets up and is off to the tomb for the task that is before her with the burial spices that needed to be placed on Jesus. But when she gets there, tomb is empty. The stone is rolled away. Her first reaction, which would have been any of our reactions, was to think, where have they taken the Lord? Who has stolen the body of my Lord? And she expressed that so clearly. Who would do this? Not only had they killed him, but her hope had been smashed and destroyed. And now, the indignity of a proper burial, they had taken it all away in such heartache and grief. You see, I believe that Mary came to the tomb and now seeing the empty tomb, she was distraught and she was weeping. And she was bewildered by it all. How? How could this be? Mary goes back and she gets the disciples, Peter and John. And as we look at Peter and as they begin to make their way to the tomb, we see Peter, who was the one who was always outspoken, who was always the first one to jump up And do something. Who had pledged his loyalty to Jesus no matter what. And yet, he denied him three times. Three times denying that he knew them. If you recall in scripture, Peter even rebuked Jesus when he said that he would die and he would be raised again in three days. Jesus in turn rebuked Peter and said, you don't have God's plan in mind. Just your own thoughts and plans. You see, Jesus was speaking the truth. Jesus was speaking the heart and knew what he was saying, but Peter, in his own thinking, would not receive what Jesus had said. Peter pledged his loyalty, but when push come to shove, he denied him. He didn't stand up for Jesus. He didn't open his mouth when a little servant girl said, aren't you one of them? He denied him. Said, I don't even know the man. And he began to curse. His words were not of great value for what he had promised to Jesus. So what was Peter's reaction when he saw the empty tomb, when on his way to the tomb? I believe part of it was the recounting of his failure. The very fact that he had denied Jesus, that he didn't belong with the rest of them. His response to Jesus' death was confusion and defeat. It was regret And failure. Peter, one of the first ones to see the empty tomb. For Peter, it was total confusion and fear. The third person was John that we want to look at. Now, if you remember in reading the scripture, Peter and and John were there when Mary came. And it says that they they both got up and began to run to the tomb. 
It was a bit of a race as far as John was concerned. He outran his friend Peter and was the first one there. Now we have to understand that John was the one that Jesus gave a special task to to care for his mother. He had been one of the closest friends of Jesus. And Mary comes to tell them his body's not there. His body's not there. But look what happened with John. He saw the linen strips lying there as if the body had evaporated. You see, what they didn't catch at first, if someone was going to steal the body, they certainly wouldn't unwrap and defile themselves by touching a dead body. But the linens that Jesus was wrapped in were still lying in the tomb. And the head cloth was folded neatly. And the scripture that we said, we read said John saw and he believed. He saw and he believed. I think it was when all the pieces began to fit together finally. He remembered what Jesus had said. He's beginning to put all the pieces together and truly he rose from the dead. Three witnesses, three different responses. Mary Magdalene was bewildered. Peter was in a state of confusion and fear. But John, John saw and believed what the Lord had promised that he would come again. So what am I saying to us today on this Easter Sunday morning that we want to model the life response of John as we go through this journey we call life? We want to see and believe. Even if you feel your world is crumbling all around you, he is still alive, amen? Amen. He lives and you can trust him for whatever situation of life you are facing. He lives To Mary, who was distraught, worried, and focused on the here and now, Jesus responded to her by only saying her name. Aren't you glad that Jesus knows you by name? Not just some little speck on the planet Earth, but he knows you by name. You can trust him. You can put your faith in him. Jesus knew all about Peter. He knew that Peter loved him, but his faith had failed. He took his eyes off Jesus and put his faith in his problem. He lost his focus. It ended up denying the one that he had so adamantly indicated that he would never fail. But then after the resurrection and Jesus was there with his disciples and he and Peter were sitting aside and and Jesus has him there and he says, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And the scripture records that Peter said, yes, Lord, you know that I love him because Jesus had restored him. He asked him that same question three times. And each time Jesus said to him, then there's something you need to do. Feed my sheep. Take care of my sheep. You have a task to complete. Now don't be distracted and just do it. Feed my sheep. As we go through this journey called life, There are only three things that we need to understand is one, that we need to know him personally in our lives. Two, we need to love him and believe in him. It's important. All three of those play a priority in our lives. So the question on this Easter Sunday is, what will you do with Jesus? What will you do with the empty tomb? Do you stand bewildered by it all? not understanding? Do you consider yourself not worthy? 
not good enough, not valued in God's eyes, I can tell you today, he loves you. He calls you to a relationship with him. But in order to have that relationship with him, we have to understand that it is sin that separates us from God. And trusting in the cross of Jesus and his forgiveness cleanses us from that sin. I want us to know that Jesus is risen today. He is still available to forgive you of your sins and transform your life, not just soften you, not just make you hard against religious things. He wants to transform you and change you. And the good news is this, it's not over. He's coming again. He will come again for his church and we will spend eternity with him. The joy of the Lord is ours. The tomb's empty. The question for us today is, what will you do with an empty tomb? What is your choice to do with Jesus? Would you bow your heads? He calls us on this Resurrection Sunday. He calls us to examine our hearts and our minds. He calls us to examine ourselves to see if we have truly received him into our heart and life, the forgiveness of our sins. And the scripture says that today is a day of salvation, not tomorrow, not sometime later, but today is a day of salvation. With heads bowed, would you receive him today? Would you ask him to come into your heart and change you and transform you? That's a desire of your heart. Would you just lift your hand where you are? Thank you. Thank you. Father, on this Resurrection Sunday, we come celebrating the empty tomb. But we also come celebrating the fact that you died on a cross for our sins. It's not about the things that you do for us and the blessings that you pour out upon us, but it's the truth in that you died for our sins and we can be forgiven from those wrongdoings, that wrong lifestyle. And you can change us, transform us, make us into a new creature. Thank you, Lord, for those who lifted a hand. I pray, Lord, that you would enable them to seek someone out that they might help them on this journey in this personal choice and decision. Open our hearts. In the remainder of this service, may we rejoice that we serve a risen Savior. Thank you for who you are. And in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Aren't you thankful today for the blood that has given us our salvation? Got a new little song for you today. I hope you like this one, but I thought it was very appropriate for today, and I think it kind of sums up the Easter story so well for us. was a wretch I remember who I was I was lost I was blind I was running out of time sin separated the breach was far too wide but from the far side of the chasm you had me in your side so you made a way Across the great divide Left behind heaven's throne To build it here inside There at the cross You paid the debt I owe Broke my chains, freed my soul For the first time I had known Thank you, Jesus, for the blood Thank you, Jesus, you have washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. took my place, laid inside my tomb of sin. You were buried for three days, but then you walked right out again. And now death has no sting, and life has no end. For I have been transformed by the blood of the Lamb. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, for the blood of life. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. There is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power of the blood, the blood that calls us sons and daughters. We are ransomed by the Father through the blood, the blood. Oh, there is nothing stronger than the wonder-working power Father through the 
sin has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life. Brought me from the darkness into glorious light. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of Give him praise, praise this, this morning. morning. Amen. 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 Let's celebrate him this morning. Proclaim that he is alive. We can put your hands together. It doesn't hurt. Let the children sing. The song of liberation, the God of our salvation set us free. Death, where is thy sting? The curse of sin is broken. The empty tomb stands open. Come and see. He's alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. He's alive. Sing out for Christ the one and only, so powerful and holy, rescued me. Death won't hurt me now, because he has redeemed me. No grave will ever keep me from my king. I'm alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. I'm alive, alive. Alive forever, amen. I'm alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. Yes, I'm alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive forever, amen. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy of a praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance. Let the people sing, worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy of the praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing, worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the praise. Worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing, worthy is the mighty King. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy of the praise, worthy is the one who has overcome the grave. Let the people dance, let the people sing. Worthy is the mighty, he's alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. Well, he's alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive forever, amen. He's alive, alive. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. Well, he's alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. Well, he's alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive forever, amen. He's alive, 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 hallelujah. Alive, praise and glory to the Lamb. Well, he's alive. He's alive, alive, hallelujah, alive forever, amen, alive forever, amen, alive forever, amen. He's alive, give him praise this morning. He is worthy of our praise. Thank you for worshiping with us. Tell someone today, he is 
alive. God bless you today.